22 years in the making, guys. There's no way that this could possibly live up to expectations, right? Hey, what's up, bookworms and mooncasts? Mike, back to talk a little. Tab Williams today is we're going to be finally dipping into Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn with book number one, guys. This is The Dragon Bone Chair. Uh, originally released in 1988 as first part of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. This is a series I think has been very, very influential in the direction that uh, modern fantasy has taken. This is kind of was the linchpin of going between Tolkien to what we know now. And uh, that's what I've always been told. So... We decided to do a, a read-along for this on the channel, which was inspired. You can watch that video where I talked about why I decided to read this. Inspired by being bullied by my brother for 22 years to read this series, right? So, uh, a, lots of expectations going in. I have very, very high expectations. Uh, just Not just because of off of what I've been, you know, just browbeaten by my brother about. But just everywhere you look, anyone who has read it usually has nothing but incredible things to say about it. And a lot of authors that I admire list this as maybe their most influential fantasy story into becoming what they became, you know? So uh, I had to give it a lot of respect off of that alone. But, uh, you know, did it meet the expectations I've had for the last 22 years? We are going to talk about it. But we're again, guys, like usual with what is this book about now? A war fueled by the powers of dark sorcery is about to engulf the peaceful land of Osin Ard. And for Presser John, the High King lies dying. And with his death, the Storm King, the undead ruler of the elf-like city, seizes the chance to regain his lost realm through a pact with the newly ascended king. Knowing the consequences of this bargain, the king's younger brother joins with a small scattered group of scholars, the League of the Scroll, to confront the true danger threatening Ostenard. Simon, a kitchen boy from the royal castle unknowingly apprenticed to a member of the League, will be sent on a quest that offers the only hope of salvation, a deadly riddle concerning long-lost swords of power. Compelled by fate and perilous magics, he must leave the only home he's ever known and face enemies more terrifying than Osin Ard has ever seen, even as the land itself begins to die. And guys, it takes it to 1988. This is The Dragon Bone Chair. Now we're going to begin like usual, guys. We're going to talk about what makes this book good or bad. I always like to begin with the good, and the good here is the character work. I told that, was told that this guy was basically a master of developing a character arc, and I can see where those uh, those, those praises have come from here, because it, he does some incredible work in just this first book alone. I think it's a slow burn, really, uh, that is used to establish, you know, the, the reputation the series has has a really glacially slow start. For me, it's a slow burn in that it develops these characters. It shows what their day-to-day -day life is like before everything kind of really goes to shit. And I think that's really, really important in a story like this. I love that he gives little clues to the backstory on some of these characters of stuff that happened prior to this book. But he doesn't give you all the answers right up front. But he leaves you asking a lot of questions. But he does give you some tasty little morsels along the way the more you learn about some of these characters. And I, I love that the, uh, the, the basically the, uh, the apprenticeship of Simon under Morganus is one of my favorite things in this book a lot. I know I'm probably saying some of these names wrong, guys. I don't audiobook. You're going to have to deal with it. I think I, I love everybody. Everybody had a different way of pronouncing uh, Morganus, I think. But uh, uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. Uh, I, I love that. But yeah, the character arcs in this book alone, especially for Simon and uh, Malachias, are fantastic. I think that, you know, where they were at the beginning of the book and where they end up at the end of the book is quite different. And I, I won't lie, guys, with Simon, he's very much, I'm going to Tashi Station to get some power converters at the beginning of this book. And by the end of it, he's the force will be with you always. It's that kind of Joseph Campbell hero's journey, but not in that predictable way that you would think. But you do go on a journey with this character where I do think a lot of people in this read along myself included, did find Simon a little annoying at first. I expect that, so it didn't really bother me. Like I said, I read a ton of traditional fantasy, so that was expecting to not really be crazy about the protagonist at first, but over the course of this journey, you really do get on his side, and you start rooting for him, and to me, that just says, Tad Williams has some great, great character work. So, uh, uh, yeah, if you find uh, Simon obnoxious at the beginning, uh, I don't believe that you're going to find him that obnoxious at the end. I mean, if you are, you might have just already kind of, you know, made your mind up, you got your arms crossed a little bit, but I don't know. I think it establishes, you know, that what happens with him in this book is very, very earned, 
And you, again, you want to know more. You want to know his lineage. You want to know all those things about the boy who leaves home kind of traditional fantasy. You've got all those questions here. And you do get a little bit of answers, but you get way more questions in a good way, in a way that hooks you to where you're like, I can't wait to read some more. But he does take some of those uh, familiar fantasy tropes, and I think that he subverts them in a good way. And I know that we become allergic to the word subvert expectations, at least I have, uh, because of what uh, what some, I, I guess some modern stories going around right now have kind of done, to where it's like, okay, we're just going to give the, the, you know, what people want, we're just going to give a big middle finger in their face. I don't think it's like that. I think it's just if you've read a lot of traditional fantasy stories, and you go into this one, you're going to be thinking, ah, I know it's going to happen next, and he won't. He won't. He will kind of zig when you expect him to zag, and I like that. I think that's a great way to do this, and it never in a way that's like, okay, well, he's just going to take everything and turn it on its head, everything that you expect to happen. No, there's some things you can be like, yeah, I saw that coming. Some things you'd be like, I totally didn't see that coming. Uh, there's like some major character reveals in this. that I. There was a big one that I figured out about 10 pages before it happened, and I thought I was going to be the only one who didn't figure it out. And just about everyone else was like, no, it completely floored me. I was totally surprised by that. So uh, it, it really is, uh, I'm on a long for the read kind of guy. I never really try to think forward. I was just putting some clues together. But uh, yeah, this is that kind of book where I didn't want to really just completely binge read it because there is a lot to unpack in some things and you want to think about some stuff. So you will be thinking about this story when you're not with it. To me, that's the the sign of a good story if you're thinking about it when you put the book down. But uh, I, I got to say, he's uh, he's shown that you can tell a story in a Tolkien-esque kind of way without just doing beat by beat what Tolkien already did. Uh, I said that someone sold the series to me, like if you could imagine that uh, you know you didn't know when this came out and say this is what J.R.R. Tolkien wrote later in life, you could see it. I can see where people are coming from there. I think that Tad Williams is much more of a wordsmith than, than J.R.R. was. No disrespect to J.R.R. I um, mean, that's my guy, right? So... But I think it's very different writing styles where I wouldn't be fooled and think that this was J.R.R. Tolkien. But I can see like this being like a a story idea that he came up with. Yeah, sure. I can see that quite a bit. It definitely, it definitely has that way where it feels like, okay, if uh, this is where Tolkien was headed, here's where he would have headed if he'd have been around, you know, in the 1980s. But uh, he's just got a sweeping world, guys, and some really cutthroat politics that are really, really good. Uh, it's where I think the uh, the Song of Ice and Fire comparisons come from, and that a lot of the uh, the politics is uh, no one's safe. You know, uh, as far as the Song of Ice and Fire comparison, um, yeah, I, I can see a lot of things, especially in and Jagger. That's a big one. It's like. Well, it's hard not to see that one. There's a lot of things, you know, uh, a female character pretending to be a boy, uh, some names that sound similar, some plot lines that seem similar. But it really, to me, it, it almost seems more like this is stuff that George saw and said, oh, I've got an idea of how to put, how I would do that if I was writing this story. It never just feels exactly like it's just a straight ripoff. Uh, but uh, I can definitely see where the people who say that are coming from without thinking they sound too crazy. But uh, I think that the, uh, the the world is is huge. It really is. And you only get a little fraction of it. You get uh, some history on some of that other stuff in Ocenar, but you uh, you really only see like a few locations in this go around at the beginning. This is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. Now, there are some exposition or info dumps, as some people like to call them. Uh, I, I, I'm guilty of that as well. I, I think it's mostly engaging, and it's done in a way that helps to flesh out the world, but uh, it is going to have some of those things where you're like, okay, I feel like I just got the entire history of Sauron in the rings here, and uh, I think it's cool, but I can see some people being like, that's just information overload at that point. I actually bookmarked that chapter think I'm going to come back to it after I finish this series because I think that there's probably a lot of breadcrumbs there and some hints and some foreshadowing that uh, could tell you some things once you uh, know what's coming at the end of the series. But it, to me, I just I, I gave me enough hooks. I just want to know more about the history. I'm very, very interested in the in the history of this land, the lore that he's built here, and I want to know some more of it. But uh, I, I like all the mysteries and the resolutions. You know, there's are, are a lot of mysteries that are presented here at the very beginning, like what is memory star and thorn? You know, uh, it isn't just a fancy name, guys. It does actually play into the story. And it, but it gives you a lot of resolutions on some of this. It gives you a lot of answers. Like I have said, it does create some more questions. But uh, they are asking some good questions and in a way that I want to know more, not where I'm just overly frustrated with, like, you're not telling me anything and you're not making me believe that you're going to tell me what I want to know. I think it's done in a great, great way. Uh, I have to say the villains are pretty good. Uh, I, you, some of them you still, I don't want to mention the names because it isn't quite clear at the beginning. But there is some where it's kind of like, I don't know really what their motivations are, you know, to keep them just from being, you know, mustache twirling bad guy. I think we're going to get that later in the series. I feel like it's setting that up in a way. Uh, you can see that obviously there's some manipulation going on. Uh, you can obviously see right from the beginning, uh, there's this dark priest that you're pretty sure, yeah, there's no way this guy is anything other than just like the bane of evil's existence, right? I mean, um, 
to say, if you like puppies, guys, you're going to be very upset this book. Um, Ingen Jagger is really good. I, I, he's the one that I bring up a lot. Uh, very much is what the was the basis for The Hound in Song of Ice and Fire. It's impossible not to see that this guy was the inspiration for that. But I, I liked him quite a bit. I have this feeling that there's going to be way more depth to this character as the series goes on. Because I don't know what it is about him. I just feel like he's, he's more than just like the evil henchman. I think there's going to be way more to this character. And I can't wait to find out if that's true or not. So uh, a compelling villains for sure. And uh, I just want to know more about them at this point. Uh, the character deaths, guys. Now, well, it's not Song of Ice and Fire and character deaths. Characters do die in this. And uh, I, I do think it's given that sense of, well, you know, not everyone is safe because there are some unexpected deaths. Uh, I will say that I think that maybe some of them didn't have that much weight because it was characters that was kind of like, eh, you know, I didn't really hadn't really established much. I think that's going to be the case in any book one. You know, you, if you kill off some characters, it's like, really, are you really invested in that character? You know, this early in the story to lose him if it's not like the main character, you know? I mean, that's what that's what got me with the Game of Thrones was, hey, that's the main character you just killed, uh, you know. 25 year old spoiler there guys in case you didn't know that and you were off the planet when uh when game of thrones was on but uh yeah it's uh it's it's he's not scared to knife someone and i gotta say i respect that because it keeps it the kind of the one foot in the traditional fantasy realm and the one foot in the modern fantasy realm which i like is that uh you know you get to a lot of those traditional fantasy ones and it's like yeah no one ever dies you know no one important ever dies unless it's you know the the blaze of glory at the very end to, to save all their friends uh this it's like yeah people were gonna die it's gonna happen but it's also not just quite like the nihilism that a lot of modern fantasy is where it's like i gotta keep up with george r, r. martin i gotta kill as many characters as possible in fact i don't even give them any weight to their death so i think it's a really good balance between them some of my uh particular favorite characters i love benedict and kentaka i'm saying kentaka that's his his uh Basically, his direwolf, uh, Benedict, it, it says troll, but I don't think he's like the troll that you're thinking. This isn't like a John Gwynn, you know, uh, Vikings lore kind of troll or Skyrim troll. Uh, I think it's almost like a mix between like a dwarf and, I don't know, something else. A half man of some sort, but uh, kind of like a, a dwarf without like a big burly beard is kind of how I am imagining him. But uh, some people have said it's pronounced troll. So I'm like, oh, okay, so maybe that's that's what it is. But uh, Benedict is a very interesting character uh, that grow to uh, have lots of opinions about one way or the other. Uh, it's, it's very clear from the get-go. This guy knows a lot more than he's letting, he's letting on. And, you know, Kentaka, anytime you've got an animal companion, especially a wolf in fantasy, you got my heart. It doesn't take much more to do that. I like Iskrimnir a lot. And, uh, and, and Sludig, these are Rimmer's men, which are basically like the Vikings in this world. Uh, these are two characters I think that... Uh, I like the Iskrimner right away, you know, because you see the relationship that he had with King John. Uh, I think that's really good. You get some really cool stuff there, uh, really touching stuff, you know, like a, there's one part we talk about where the, you know, with the king is like, oh, is he, he's going to be cold. And without context, you don't know what that means, but it was a really, it's a really powerful line, I thought. Uh, that was really good. But Sludig is one who actually travels with Simon later. And I thought this was just going to be a throwaway character, but he has some of the best lines. There's some conversations with he has to some characters. It's just really, really good. So I hope that character continues to develop because, like I said, a lot of those side characters will get you know knifed in this. But uh, Sludig is one that I thought that really had some good growth that I didn't expect. So I'm hoping to see more of that character. And look, guys, just at the end, book part three. This has three parts in this book. Part three is just straight fire. Stuff that I didn't expect to happen in this book, you got battles, you got betrayals, you got all kinds of crazy stuff happen. This this is like uh, you know at least book two or book three in a trilogy stuff in it happened at the end of this first book here. So really good. I think that it'll make it really rewards you in a way to where uh, you know part one can be kind of slow for some people, part two can be slugger for some people, part three I think everyone's gonna love. So it really will make it feel like it was earned. And the guys can't say enough, guys. About Tad Williams' writing style, a guy is a beautiful writer, magnificent. You know, I'm not one to sit in here and talk about prose very much, but when I notice it, I think it is very, very good. I think it's quite comparable to what I've read with uh, Miss Robin Hobb so far. So uh, you, you guys are Robin Hobb fans. I think you're going to be right at home with this series. Let's talk about the not-so-good guys, and I think this is uh, always going to be subjective to you. There's a couple things that might have bugged me a little bit. I think there's a lot of characters that don't get differentiated. Like, there's a lot of realms and lands and things like that. But even if you get that, I had a hard time being like, okay, uh, whose side are they on? Who are they allied with? I don't remember. So when there's like some deaths and some shocking things on there, I'm just like, I, I don't know. I wasn't really invested in that yet. Basically, if it wasn't at Naglamund, if it wasn't at the Hayholt, I found myself, or just with the Simons group, I just found myself not really being too engaged with it. Now, I feel like maybe this will be 
you know, built upon in the sequels. But as for this book, I did find myself keep flipping back to the Dramatis and being like, who was this character again? Where are they? What are they about? Because I could not remember. So I hope that's something that actually gets a little more clarified. And so you can maybe spend a little more time with those people and find out really what their motivations are. Maybe we'll learn a little bit more about them. I, had, I think I had a hard time remembering who was allied with who was the hardest thing because there are people switching sides a lot and stuff like that. So it, it, you might want to set yourself up a nice little flow chart or something like that. Uh, the, the pacing, guys, like that's just going to bother a lot of people. Part one is the part that gets the flack for being really slow. For me, I found part two kind of the sluggish part because I'm not wild about just traipsing across the landscape you know i just just journeying it's like you know what you don't have to fast travel you just don't have to tell me everything you can be like hey it's been like you know three weeks later you know they've been traveling this whole time you don't have to tell me everything that they're doing i think in most part it was important to build the relationship between benedict and, and simon and of course uh, malachi uh, it, it, it is very important so I, I know why it's there it's just sometimes it did feel a little sluggish but uh yeah i think i said i think that part three really really made up for it and that's something I feel like on a reread, maybe, if you're the type that does that, you wouldn't have any problems there at all. But let's talk about why I think that you guys should read it. Look, if you if you want to see a story, like I said, it kind of bridges the gap between traditional fantasy and what we've come to know modern, modern fantasy at. It showed that you can do the traditional things without having to be beholden to them. You could you could spin off and do your own thing. You could do something different. You could do Tolkien without doing play-by-play -play of what Tolkien had already done. I think he does this brilliantly and uh, i think it's a, one of those kind of stories guys if if you want some traditional fantasy but it's still got a little higher stakes than some traditional fantasy has i think this is going to be exactly what you're looking for doesn't have quite the nihilism like i said that modern fantasy seems to fall into uh, look osinar is not a nice place bad things happen a lot of atrocities still occur so i don't want you thinking oh this is just happy go lucky you're going to have a great time here there's still a lot of bad things that happen in this land but you're never just going to feel like you're crawling through mud, like I know a lot of modern fantasy has fallen into now. Where they just got they got to make everything just the most dreary, cruel, and punishing world possible. And look, the grimdark guy, I love that. But if you need a break from that, and I did need a break from that, I think this is perfect. This is going to be exactly what you're looking for. But uh, yeah, this is just everything I think you can see that modern fantasy took notes from. Uh, it's really on display well in this very first outing here. Now, if I got some final thoughts, I think that if I was describing this book to someone, I'd say it kind of feels like what happens after Happily Ever After. So, I mean, you got this land at peace, you got the kingdoms united, all that stuff, everything's great, things are aplenty. What happens after that? What happens after that after that after that king or queen dies and you know the next generation takes over and the old prejudices and greeds return? I feel like that's what this is. What happens after happily ever after? You know, like 30 years down the road, you know, after this rule ends, how does the next rule happen? I think that's a great place to take this story. But I think it's a great way to show how fantasy has evolved without forgetting what brought us here in the first place? He's not afraid to use those traditional fantasy tropes. You know, farm boy leaves home kind of thing. He's not afraid to use that. The dark overlord. He's not afraid of that. But he does it in a different kind of way that I've seen with a lot of fantasy written pre-1990 where he's not afraid to take some chances and he's not afraid to shock you a little bit with uh, with how cruel he can be as a writer sometimes. That, that's just great. Just twists and turns uh, where you just feel like not everyone's safe. That's that's always something that I'm going to enjoy. I need some stakes. I need to know not everyone's going to be. They're not going to have like this huge battle and these 30 or 30 heroes are going to live and all the enemies are going to be vanquished kind of thing. I don't need everyone to get stabby. But, you know, I need some realism. I need to know that, you know what? I know you like that character. Sometimes people that you like will die in a battle. I think that's very, very important. So uh, very excited to continue uh, with Stone of Farewell, starting that tomorrow, February the 1st. We are reading this along on our Discord server, guys. If you want to join us, hey, uh, we are going to be taking four months to read the three books because book three we're splitting in half because uh, it's so long. So if you want to get caught up, you can probably get caught up before then. Uh, probably not before Stone of Farewell tomorrow, but hey, we, again, we're going to take one month for each of these. So we're going to be reading these all the way through the end of April. So if you want to catch up, you want to chat with us on there, we would love to have you join us on there. But as for this book, guys, I don't want to say a pleasant surprise because I did have my expectations, but I feel like it met them. Didn't quite exceed them, but I think it very much uh, met them. And for all the people asking, hey, are you going to have your brother on here to talk to you about it? I asked him and he said, hey, no, was his exact exact words. He's not the, it's not quite as, as comfy with the camera as I am, you guys. In fact, I, I texted him after I finished book one. I was like, man, you're right. This is really good. You know what he said? One sentence response. He just said, no shit. So... 
I don't think he'd have too much feedback on here except to say, yeah, you're an idiot. You didn't read it sooner. So uh, excited to continue, guys. I'm excited that I, I would say at least 9 out of 10 people that read it on the Discord were over the moon happy with it. So seems like a very, very good start in a series, like I said, that has quite the acclaim. So it's not really surprising that we're having that much success. But I'm just glad that it seems like I'm going to have a higher success rate, a higher finish rate. With, uh, with my read-along on this one than I have on Malazan. I'm very excited to have people along with me. So guys, have you read The Dragon Boat Chair? What did you think? Drop in the comments below and uh, let me know, and I will talk to you there.